welcome back to Quantitative Analysis in Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrin, and today we're going to be talking about linear regression. This is topic five, and we're on lesson one. So we're going to begin talking about Francis Galton. And as I said in one of the previous lessons in the last topic, I really like trying to bring <clears throat> the history of anthropology into the study of statistics because to me they go hand in hand, at least early on and again in this sense of, of what explains variation best, race or culture? Culture one, but the race part developed, or out of the race part developed a lot of the statistics that we use today. And Galton was one of the major figures both in race theory and in terms of statistics. He was, in fact, the chairperson of, I believe it's Section H, but of the anthropology section of the Royal Academy of Sciences uh, when he was a, a member and became president of the Royal Academy. So he was really the father of thought, of the conceptual thought, about correlation and regression. And in the last topic, we learned that his protege, and a person who apparently really idolized Galton, Carl Pearson, is the one who put the mathematics to correlation and regression. Galton is the person who brought up the concepts. Pearson was the one who created or developed the mathematics for it. What Galton was interested in is human variation. And he was interested in that, ultimately, for eugenics. But he was a relative of Darwin, Charles Darwin, and was interested in evolution and in evolutionary theory. And he thought it was proper to bring those ideas to understanding humans and human development and, and the development of the races. For at the time, there were lesser and higher races at least that was the basis of race theory. How do those evolve? How do those change? And so to do that, he developed a number of conceptual ideas about how to measure variation in order to, to see how variation can change over time. And one of the things that's really important in anthropology, especially if you do any um, ethnology, which is comparative anthropology, the comparison of different cultures to look at variation, is something called Galton's problem. And Galton's problem comes out of a discussion when he, Galton, was the president of the Royal Academy of Sciences. Um, and E.B. Tyler, whose name you should know because Tyler gave the first definition of culture. Culture as that complex whole, blah, blah, blah. That was Tyler. Tyler gave a presentation where he was comparing different cultures to look at variation in terms of um, basically historical uh, and sort of environmental conditions, pushing the culture side, the cultural side of what explains variation by looking really at cultural variation and how it relates to other forms of cultural variation. And Galton brought up a very interesting problem, and he was going to try and poke holes in this, right? Because he's on the other side of the argument. Galton brought up this problem of how do you know that those cultures are independent of one another? And Galton, looking at this, may have, we can't read this into what he talks about, may have seen these are people of the, of the same race that have different cultures. Well, if they're members of the same race, maybe we're misjudging the cultures or misjudging who they are. And basically what he argued is, how do you know these are different cases? Remember that we talked about in measurement and sampling, that we need to create and understand our unit of analysis. The unit of analysis from t for Tyler was a culture. Well, how do you define that? How do you know that one culture is not different from another? Maybe they inherited traits from one another. Maybe they were branches of the same uh, parent culture, and really the reason they have traits that are similar or even different are because they branched away from that parent culture. How do we know that? That's Galton's problem. And what it is, 
is something today we call autocorrelation. Autocorrelation or the non-independence of cases. And if you think about it, if your cases are not independent, you're going to have automatic correlation, right? Because if you're measuring case A on one trait and it has a correlation with some other trait, and then you measure case B, except that case B is not actually independent on case A, but is a piece of the same case, it's going to have the same. And so they're going to obviously be correlated. They're going to show an autocorrelation. That's Galton's problem. It's a really important problem. Uh, and it just shows you some of the degree to which Galton was anticipating developments in statistics and an under understanding conceptually of statistics that would occur decades later. And I want to get back to this. It's all about anthropology, about understanding variation in humans. Okay, so regression. We're going to start off with regression. I don't like the term regression. We get that term from Galton. And what Galton called this was regression to the means, is what he, he called this entire concept we're going to look at. And, and the way he got this was he was looking at variation um, in a variety of things, in humans. But then he also studied it with a very interesting apparatus where he dropped balls into like a pachinko, pachinko machine into little chutes, and they fell. And if you do that by by random, they will form a normal curve, um, so experimentally. And then he was also doing, just like Mendel, if you know Mendel and his pea plants that showed the basis for inheritance being genes, uh, he messed with pea plants too. What he found is that um, if you have a large parent and you breed them with another large parent, they still tend over generations to move back to whatever the average of a population is. If you have a freely interbreeding population, even if you have, you start out with tall people or one kind of pea or whatever, they still tend to move back to the mean of that population and so they tend to regress towards the mean because remember he's trying to make things progress in a new direction, especially humans and eugenics. They want them to progress into being better and better. Well, that doesn't apparently happen in a normal, in a normal, in a natural population, in a natural breeding population. You try and push them in one direction, they tend to regress to the mean of the population. That's where regression comes from. We should talk about it in terms of prediction. I think that's a much better way of talking about it because that's what we really are talking about in, in terms of the statistics. Because of this pattern that things tend to regress to the mean, that means that we can predict from the mean, essentially, one value, one trait from another because they keep being pulled back to that mean, so they form a natural relationship. This is about prediction. Okay. With prediction, we have to distinguish two different flavors of variables, and it doesn't matter what they are, although we're really talking about um, interval data, ordinal regression you can do, and you even can do a form of nominal regression that goes far beyond what we are going to do here. Um, but we will talk a bit about ordinal regression. Um, Today we're just going to be looking at um, interval data and linear regression. Anyway, we have two different flavors of variables. One of them is called dependent and the other one is called independent. The independent variable is free to vary in, in a regression model or a prediction model. The independent variable is free to vary. The dependent variable is seen to be dependent on the value of the independent variable. In other words, the value of the independent variable 
predicts or actually, in a sense, you could say, creates the value of the dependent variable. The dependent variable's value is dependent on the value of the independent variable. That may seem complicated right now. It'll be obvious in a little bit. What we're looking for in regression is the best fit or the least squares linear relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable or one or more independents or one or more dependents, depending if we're doing simple linear regression or what's called multiple regression. Best fit, I'll show you, or least squares means a line that runs through the cloud of points that you see in a scatter plot with the minimum amount of distance, the minimum amount of squared distance, of squared error, we've seen that before, right? That's variance squared error, the minimum amount of squared error among all those points. I'll show you that. If you find that line, or when you find that line, it allows you to predict the value of the dependent variable based on the value of the independent variable. You got that? If not, go back and listen to this again, because we're going to move on. This is a scatter plot that we saw in, during the last topic from the Boaz immigrant data set. You can get sick of hearing about that, aren't you? But it's a great data set for this course. Age and stature, and this is just the youth, right? So this is how young people grow over time. Okay, this is a right scatter plot. We turn this into a regression plot by adding the best fit line or the least squares line, the line that has the least of the squared difference from of each point to the mean. So essentially think about it this way. You put a line through here and you calculate the difference from, of each point to the value of whatever that line is. So you take H5 and you have all these points, through that point you want to figure out the point within there with the least squared difference from that point, right? So the, where all of these points are closest to that line and you keep doing that until essentially you rotate that line all around in here until you get the best fit, the one that minimizes the total variance from that line minimizes the squared error of that measure. Got that? How do you do that? Use calculus. We're not going to get anywhere near that. But it, it actually is not that terribly difficult of a thing to achieve. This is a, an image of that line. This is the best fit through this cloud of points in terms of minimizing the error of the points distance to that line. Got it? The least squares regression line. The minimum or the least amount of squared error is running through there. It's the best fitting line in terms of minimizing error through that cloud of points. That's regression. What regression allows you to do is this on the bottom on the x-axis is always the independent variable. On the y-axis is always the dependent variable. The underlying logic of regression, or this is why I like to call it prediction, is that if you know the value of age, you go up to this line and then over it allows you to predict the stature in this case. 10, let's look at 5. 5, you go up here, and it's like 100 and something would be the, the stature. Okay. Here's the equation. I keep promising you no more equations, and they keep coming up. <coughs> but 
don't worry about these equations. These are really easy ones. Uh, you've seen one of these before, this one, the equation for a line. This line. You've seen these before. Z-scores. Okay. This is what's called a hat. This is Z hat. Z hat. Hat means a predicted value. Okay? The Z score, the predicted Z score, Z hat of Y, Y axis, that's the dependent variable, is equal to the correlation coefficient R times the Z of the value on X. Now, if we go back here, we've got numbers, not z-scores. But if you think about it, it's the same thing, right? We can convert all those into z-scores. What do we call that? We call it standardizing them. Yes, standardizing them. So if we use standardized scores, the equation of this line, or the predicted value of zy, z-score on the dependent axis versus the z-score on the x-axis is just the z-score on the x-axis times the correlation coefficient. That's pretty simple, right? So if we add z-scores here, we would take whatever this z-score is, and, and here's the middle, and let's say that's a z-score of 1. We'd multiply that z-score times the correlation coefficient, and here it's about 0.9. We go up, and then this value would be about 1 times 0.9 would be like around 0.9. That's, that's how that would work if we had z-scores or standardized scores. So this is the very, that's really the relationship here. It's, remember, correlation is the cross product of the z-scores, the sum of the cross product of the z-scores. We can convert that into a prediction equation where the predicted value of the z on y, the dependent variable, is equal just to the correlation coefficient times the value of uh, the independent variable, the z on x. To turn that into real numbers, we use the equation for a line, right? You all learned this in grade school, that y equals, I always heard it as mx plus b, but y equals some value times x plus some constant value, uh, which is the, in the intercept, all right? So this is y hat. The predicted value of y, right, predicted value of z there, this is the predicted value of y, a raw score, not a z score, is equal to something that we call beta. That's really what we want to find when we're doing regression, something called beta times x plus whatever the uh, intercept value, whatever this constant is. Um, y equals beta times x plus c. All right, let's look at this. Y equals some value times x plus some constant. All right, y equals some value times x plus some constant. So what is that value? Well, we're going to talk about this in terms of a regression model. Regression model. In this case, y hat, y hat, the predicted value, is 4.7x. That's the x value, plus 81.6. I get that by doing a regression analysis, creating a regression model. And that's a calculation thing that we'll get into uh, when, we, when we use R, uh, and, but we're not going to get into here in terms of calculating by hand. Predicted value of Y then is equal to 4.7, this is the beta coefficient, time of x plus this constant, okay? So, if we go out to five years old, right? Five years old, we go up here, the value here we should be able to predict would be 
5 times 4.7, which is like 25, 20, let's say 23, plus about 80. So it should be about 73. Well, is that right? 5, or sorry, 20, 73, about 104. So, see, even I can't do math, right? About 104, 105. 25 plus 81.6, 105, 106, somewhere in there. We go up here, all right, come over here. Oh, look, that's 100. Yeah, it's like 106. That's 150. Here's 100. So, yeah, like 106. It's like magic. Okay, that's how regression or prediction works. The next question is, how do we know how good our prediction are, is? This one actually is a really good prediction, but what if we have one of those situations where you have a big cloud of points? Really, how good can your prediction be? And the answer is, it's not as good. There's a really good predictive power here. How do I know that? Okay, we're going to take a very short break. We're going to come back to this same slide, and we're going to talk about how we know whether this regression line is very good in terms of predicting y hat from x. Okay? We'll be right back. All right, we're back. And we were looking at the equation of a regression line where we have predicted value y hat, and it's determined by beta coefficient times the independent variable value plus a constant. Okay, how do we know that this equation is actually good at predicting y from x? Well, if you'll remember from an earlier topic, we looked at this relationship between age and stature, and we found out that the R, the correlation coefficient, is 0.93, and that's very strong. Uh, so that's a very strong correlation. And from that, we know that this is a good predictor. Why? Because the predictive ability of one of these equations is equivalent to the correlation coefficient squared. It's called R squared. So here, the strength of the regression model is 0.87. What does that mean? All right, we'll go on to talk about that. It's a very important and interesting difference. R, Pearson correlation coefficient, is a measure of association. How much stature and age, in this case, are associated with one another. And it's just a measure of association. It's based on the cross product of the Z scores. It is dimensionless. And, and so it, it, it doesn't really tell us anything very specific other than the degree to which the Z score on Y can be predicted by the z-score on x. But because it's in standardized scores, it's, it's hard to deal with. It turns out, after doing a lot of mathematical proofs, that you can show that for just normal variables, not standardized, but just normally measured variables, that the measure of prediction, how well one variable, the independent variable, predicts another variable, the dependent variable, is equivalent to R squared. In this case, that's 0.87. Okay. R is a measure of association. R squared is a measure of prediction. So, R squared 0.87 means that if I know a person's age from whatever this population is, 
I can predict their stature about 87% better than if I didn't know about this relationship, if I didn't know that prediction line. Using that prediction line, we could put this another way. Using that prediction line, I can predict in this population an individual's stature by their age, if I know their age, with an 87% accuracy. Or I can predict it accurately 87% of the time. Technically, what this means is that this regression line accounts for 87% of the variance in the data set. But that's hard to think about. I like to think about it. That, that's really, if we're talking about regression as, as a mathematical concept, if we're talking about it practically or pragmatically, what the R-squared tells us is how much better our guess is about the value of the Y variable if we know the value of the X variable. 87 is huge. But that makes sense in this case, right? Because we know children grow at a regular clip, so to speak. And so we should be able to predict height by age. And in fact, as I mentioned in the last topic, doctors use that to see if children are growing properly or not. So that we have this level of predictive ability is probably not unusual here. You're very rarely going to see something that's strong. Mostly what you'll see in terms of we want to see a strong R-squared in social science research would be something in the fours, 0.4 or even 0.5. That would be incredible. More often, 0.3. But even if you think about that, you can increase your guess on the value of the independent variable if you know the value on the dependent variable by 30%. Well, that's pretty good. If you could do that in Vegas on blackjack, you could make a fortune because you'd be right 30% of the time. And, you know, those odds would be, those are pretty good. So, we know about prediction from R squared. Let's look at another example. We saw this uh, in the last topic. This is kind of an artificial negative relationship that I created based on immigrant year and age. Age is the dependent variable. Immigrant year is the independent variable. That's artificial, right? It doesn't really make sense. Why am I predicting age based on immigrant year? But it's because if, if the data are collected around 1910, you have to be, you know, 50 years old when you came over because well, if you came over in 1860, you have to be at least 50 years old because that's been 50 years, right? So if you're brought over as a baby, you're going to be 50, but you're probably going to be older. So this is sort of artificial, but it's fine for uh, instruction. So this is that negative correlation. If you'll remember, the correlation was minus 0.51, and that's pretty good. Uh, if we saw this in social science research, we'd go, yes we've got a result. We have an association here we can look at. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I think a lot of this is coming out here in correlations. Outliers throw things off, and we have a big bunch of young people here. All right, here's the best fit or least squares regression line running through this cloud of points. You can tell it is not nearly as good as the one with stature and age. The cloud of points is much wider, and so that least squares line, boy, there's a lot of variation around that line. How good a predictor is that? R squared. It's going to be 0.27, about a quarter of, uh, about a quarter percent, about a quarter of the time, if I know the year a person immigrated, I could predict perfectly 
their age or my guess about a person's age is improved by about twenty seven percent if i know the year they immigrated that's not that great but it's still if you're doing betting if those are the, the odds that's pretty good frankly um, notice that r squareds are positive because a uh, negative squared is going to be a positive, and a positive squared is going to be a positive. But even so, the relationship is a negative one, even though the R squared is positive. The relationship is a negative one. So what's the, what is the, um, the line here? The line here is a little bit weird because it's this. Y hat predicted value of y, in this case it's age, is minus 0.94, that's the beta, times x, times immigrant year. So it's almost the immigrant year, right? It's 0 .9, minus 0.94. But what's happening is it's turning it negative, plus 1823. So essentially what you've got is you're taking a person in 1870, making them minus, you know, it's close to 1870. It's probably, what, 1850, if you take away that. So 1850, 1860, plus, 18, plus 1823. So you're way down here on this, right? Negative 18 something. You add 1823, and you come up here to whatever, 60. So that's what's going on with this particular predictive equation. So what have we learned here? We already know R, cross product of the Z scores. R squared becomes a measure of the predictive ability of those Z scores or the strength of the relationship of that cross product of the z scores. And it's equivalent to about the percent by which a guess about the dependent variable is increased if you know the independent variable. So, there's a lot of stuff we covered here today. Um, if you're confused at all about it, go back, watch the video again, do some exercises try and get this straight because you'll find that regression is something that you're going to come across very often in the literature. Um, it's something that you'll find is extremely useful. Like partial correlation, you can control for other variables, but you can do so fairly easily using regression in a, in a, a form that's called multiple regression. And you can do it in lots of interesting ways. So it becomes a very powerful tool for you to use in research. We're covering just the basics of it here so that you can understand in a simple way how you might apply it and what you're going to read about in literature. But regression itself is one of the best tools that we have in the toolkit. And if you have the time or the interest, learn more about regression, multiple regression, other forms of regression, logic, probe it. Uh, there are all these different interesting things to go through. Regression is a fascinating topic. Anyway, we'll see you next time.